And we were discussing about my leaving on either Tuesday night or Wednesday morning to begin now in Wichita, Kansas for Friday. I told him I couldn't get to the north because of the snow. And we were thinking, hearing that song start, Only Believe. And I looked over at him and I said, nation after nation, tongues and people has that song called me to the platform for the past ten years or more. And I said, when, if I go before the Lord Jesus comes, it is fixed that when they are putting me into the ground, they are going to stand and sing, only believe while I'm going into the ground. I said, I hope when, if I get to come to heaven that they'll be saying it when I get there, those who pass on. For that truly what I believe is the Lord Jesus. Now we are the handkerchiefs and things to be prayed over. That is such a, a great expression of, of faith of the people. There's so many things that I can say from the uh, bigger part of my ministry almost is sending out these handkerchiefs and things because I contact more people. And I've been said many times, Brother Bram, Brother Roberts, or Brother Allen, or some of those other men will pray for 500 dollars a year getting three or four. Well, that's perhaps true. But, you know, they're doing what God tells them to do, and I'm doing what God tells me to do. So, I, my ministry is a little different. But I contact a lot of people is this way, by the, the handkerchiefs and aprons and little claws. And you're welcome to spend in my home any time, if you wish one, just Jeffersonville, Indiana, if you first off it's about 325, but just Jeffersonville, it'll come to me. And um, so we're happy, and we spend around to all thousands of them weekly, all over the world. And a great success has been done for people believing and having faith in God for their healing. And now... We will pray over these before leaving this afternoon, and you can get them, but if you happen not to put one up here, just write to my place. You'll be sent to you absolutely free. There's no, there's no charges or nothing that we have. Not a thing. No services is charged, no charges for anything. We got some books. The boys told me a few minutes ago there's just about a half a box left for Monday. We'll sell them on Sunday in the pictures, just a few of those left. On Monday and Tuesday. And um, we uh, buy those from the ones who print them. And we give them out what we buy them at 40 cents less. Bring them. People have not got the money and they want to pay how we give them to them anyhow. God makes it up some way. So there's no prices on nothing. Just feel free to send for anything or anything we can help you to make life a little better for you, make trials a little easier. That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to do it. Wish I could personally go home with each one of you and talk with you a while. I, I like to do that, but I can't do it. I just can't. But I'm sure you understand that. So, there's one thing you, you can all do for me. That's pray for me. So, that's the thing that I need more than anything I know of is prayer. I'm very hoarse. And I've been going so long, as I say, for four months now, hardly without a night off, just going all the time, with preaching, praying for the sick. And it certainly you can tell a difference after you preach that long. You can imagine then the healing services is twice as hard on me as what the preaching is. So this afternoon, the Lord willing, we have chosen a little text just to talk to the people a while. And then tomorrow the healing services and so forth will start on again. We don't know what our Lord will do. He might just come right down the stage and have the biggest healing service we ever had. We don't know. He just he does it his own way. We just try to follow his lead. And now before we open his blessed word in the way that we raise back and read, 
Let us just talk to him just a little bit by prayer as we bow our head. Our blessed Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the privilege that we have of coming into this lovely big arena this afternoon, a shelter over our head, and to be assembled in the name of Thy Son, the Lord Jesus, and to know that in this dark and dreadful hours that we're living, at the end of the age, that there's still thousands of people who believe on you and are looking for your soon coming. And we feel today that this is the elect, the cream of the crop of Oakland, and it's round and round that's gathered here this afternoon. They have come for one purpose, to hear the word of God and to fellowship around it. And we humbly pray, our Father, that thou wilt take over this service into your own hands, your own control, and will get glory to thyself. Sanctify the voice that's to speak as truly as it is, it's all I have, Father, that it's given to you. And sanctify the ears that will hear. And may every heart receive, and may it not be thought of as a message of man, but may it be as one from God. For we are listening and waiting to hear everything that we can for instructions that we might stand before thee holy and without blemish in that hour that's swiftly approaching. We ask this blessing in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> in the book of Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, and the 26th verse, I read this portion.
and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall walk in my statutes and keep my judgments. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Ezekiel, the uh, 36th chapter, and uh, the um, 26th and 27th verses. Now, we wish to speak this afternoon on this great, mighty prophet Ezekiel and his prophecy. And now, you know, the prophets of the Bible was thought of as God's eagles. Now, in study of nature, as I have been preaching, because it was my first Bible to lead me to Christ. We never had a Bible in our home. When I was 20 years old, we never seen a Bible as far as I know in our home. We wasn't religious at all. My people formerly were Catholic, and they had left the church, married out of the church, and was gone. And they didn't have any religion at all. And then the Lord, just by His grace, picked me up. And it makes me love Him. Oh, I can never. There's something within me that holds the love of God. And now, in studying nature, it, I'd see where God's great wisdom was, was to let me understand the natural things. So, without an education, uh, I could then be able to understand maybe the supernatural. For all of the things in the supernatural, or the natural, or types of things in supernatural. I don't know whether you get that or not, but that, that is true. Everything in earth is made of something above, and types and so forth. It's shadows, our own shadow here on this earth. It, what we are now is just a, a type of what we will be in that glorious resurrection. When all of the sin and sickness and sorrows and death has finished. And the eagle was a type of the prophet. Now the eagle is a mighty bird. And one of the saddest sights I ever seen in my life was one day at the Cincinnati Zoo. My boy was telling me a few moments ago they've got one just across the lake here. And some kind of a... A uh, little place uh, where they got some animals over there, like a little zoo. And uh, I don't even want to see. If anything I hate to see is anything caged up. And I hate to see Christians caged up. If you give your canary bird all the orthodox food you could give him and then keep him in a cage, what good is he going to do him? Give him good food. Make him strong wings if you won't get him room to fly. So that's what I think the Christian has been, has caged up. We are to be free. If we study the Word and believe the Word, give us room. Sure, let's get out and get moving. Ex exercising our faith. And then I noticed this great, mighty bird, the eagle, and how he would take his great wings and he'd beat against the... the cage and he'd fall backwards and he'd look up towards the sky and he would beat again all the feathers was off of his wings and, and his head was all beat up and he would lay on his back when he whipped them great bars and fly back he would look up his eyes weary would look at the skies because he's a heavenly bird he can fly higher than any other bird there is what a hawk's not a match for him in no manner. Not a bird on earth can fly with the eagle. He goes way in the air. No other bird could stand it. He's not built for that kind of an altitude. He would die if he went up there. The air is so thin, he couldn't breathe it. It'd perish and drop to the earth. But the eagle is made a heaven-soaring bird. Now, if you'll get what I mean, this afternoon I intend it to be a lesson to the people, as the Lord will let me speak. You see, gifts and callings are without repentance. We have need of a mockingbird. 
We have need of the rain. We have need of all the other birds and of the eagles. But the eagle can't help it because he's an eagle. God made him an eagle. And there's no need of any other bird trying to come up with him because they just can't go that far. Neither could the eagle be quick and sharp like a little hummingbird. But everything has its place. And every gift of the church has its place. Just because one's an eagle and one's something else and one's something else, that's all working together in God's great economy for the good. Everything. But now, if the hummingbird tried to be an eagle, he would ruin himself. And if the eagle tried to be a hummingbird, he would ruin himself. See? And if the dove tried to be a crow, he would die. <laughs> See? And the crow can't be a dove. So there you are. We just differ. And God makes us this way. But the eagle, we're talking about him now. God likened his prophets to eagles. Now the reason he likened that is because the higher you go, the further you can see. If you can get up so high above the earth, you can see the entire earth as it's round. And the higher you get, the further you can see. And God had his prophets of the Old Testament, which God in sundry times, divers manners, spake to the fathers by the prophets. But in this last day, he had spoke to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. And now, as the Old Testament prophets would raise way up in the Spirit, way high, they could look far off and would see things that were coming. God would raise them up. And now, if the eagle could go ever so high, and his eye wasn't according to his, his ability of his flying, then he wouldn't do him any good to fly out there if he was blind when he got there. But he, his eye is made to compare with the rest of his body. And when he gets up, he sees, and he can look way off. And the Old Testament prophet would rise in the spirit and go way up and would see see things that were coming to pass. And Ezekiel was one of God's eagles, his prophets. And he would go way up, and he could see far off, and even seen all the way down to our age now. About 2,500 years away, he could see as he raised up in the Spirit of God. And he seen the day that we're living in. And that's why he can write it, and we can watch it as it comes to pass. What the Bible prophets have said, every word will be fulfilled. Sometimes it's hard for us to believe it, but God will do it anyhow, because it's his word, and he's, he's all wisdom, he's infant. He understands, he knows just what was and what will be. Therefore, he could predestinate to make everything work for his good. Now, man's on the basis of free moral act, free moral act, um, agency. And he cannot, uh, God could not take a man and say, now I'm going to make you do this. I'm going to make you be, to be a, a lost man. I'm going to make you be a saved man. That wouldn't be the nature of God. No, he's not willing that any should perish, but he wants all to repent. But if he was being infant as he is, he knew from the beginning who would perish and who would not perish, because he knew what would be. Now, he's not willing that it would be that way. He wants all to come back to him, but he knows who will and who won't. So therefore, he could, by full knowledge, he could make everything work right according to his plan. Oh, aren't you happy for a father like that? Just think of every one of you in here today that's got your name on the Lamb's Book of Life. You never put it there. And your preacher never put it there. Neither your church put it there. But God put it there. And when did God do it? It's written in the blood of the Lamb. How many believe that? There isn't enough ink remover or whatever it is in the world to get it out of there. Look, God put your name on the book of life 
at the foundation of the world, the Bible said. We're just nothing. You never had nothing to do with it. I never had nothing to do with it. God himself did it at the foundation of the world. When he slew the lamb, by foreknowledge, he knew that Christ would be here, and he was called the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, and the beast will receive all the dwells upon the earth, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, from the foundation of the world. I wish you Pentecostal people could see that. That's one thing you're assured in. That's what brings fear and trouble to you. Or you say, Brother Graham, I'm afraid you're well off on the deep end of eternal security and all this oil. Oh, no, you don't have to worry about that. If you keep your heart in the Bible, it won't. That's right. It's a, it's a word of God. And a, a man said, well, I'm saved. I just do what I, I always do what I want to do. And if I know my motives is wrong, then I better go back to the altar. Because if God's in me, I only want to do those things that please God. It's the nature of the, of the person that makes him do what he does. That's the nature. And God in the beginning knew every person that would ever be on the earth. At the beginning. He knew every fly, every flea, everything that would ever be. He's infant and he knew everything. And so therefore, the day that our names on the Lamb's Book of Life they were placed there before the foundation of the world. And the gospel to be preached is nothing in the world but the saving all of the fish out of the lake, as Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven is, you said, what's the use of preaching then? A preacher's got his part to do. He's got the kingdom of heaven like one that's cast in it and pulled it. Now, there's so many fish in that lake, and when the last one's brought out, that's the end of it. Now, a, a preacher, he just throws in the net. He pulls. In that great net, the Bible teaches, he brings in everything. He brings in water spiders, frogs, snakes, lizards, terrapins, tadpoles, and fish. Now, it's not for me to determine or to judge to say which is fish and which is tadpoles, but if you'll just watch them, if you'll just watch them, the nature that's in them will prove what they are. That's right. That's exactly right. You watch a gospel message go forth. Many will come up around the altar. Sure, the net's got them. Just a little bit, there'll be an old brother Terrapin who'll stick his head up and say, I just didn't believe it in the beginning. Here's a Terrapin to start with. That's all. And the snake will say, you know there's just something about that old whole lower stuff I can't stand. Snake to begin with. That's right. The old water spider starts splop, splop, the frog, clink, clink, going back. It was that to start with. When the net went over, they were there. The Zacharite, but the fish was fish when the net went over, too. We are saving for fish. God's the one to determine. And that's if this, this Christian religion is to take its firm stand upon the ability of intellectuals, then we will not need the Holy Spirit. That's right. If the Christian faith exists upon educational programs, upon denominations, and so forth, and the building of big buildings, and whatever what we have today, then we do not need the Holy Spirit to run God's church. That's right. Then the best thing for us to do, if that be it, we're in the right program. Let's have every person that can get a denomination started, let's do it. Let's build the biggest churches we can have. And let's have the most smartest preachers we can get. Let's have the best degreed man that we can. Let's oust the poor and the so forth in the street and get the best dressed and the best mental position people that we can. The best in intellectuals. If that's what the church is to be run by, intellectuals. But brother, this great new spirit that we're speaking about, this great new church that Ezekiel saw here, was not to be run upon intellectuals. It was to be run by the Holy Spirit. And then if the Holy Spirit is to run the church, 
We don't need so much fussing about denominations and about the intellectuals and who can say, I'm and the prettiest and dress the best. We don't need that. Then let's do what Jesus told us to do. Go into the streets and the byways and get the lame, halt, blind, poor, and whatever more and bring them in so the great suppers will be set one of these days. We need that. That's the type of religion that we need. Then we wonder how we get it. Now, we never was commanded to produce fruit. No, sir. God never said anywhere to produce fruit. We are to bear fruit. And there's quite a difference in producing and bearing. Now, we produce education. We produce psychology. We produce intellectual, the outside form. But to bear the fruit, it will speak on the inside coming out. We're trying to smear it on the outside. But God's church isn't built like that. It's from the inside coming out. The apple don't come from the outside of the tree. It comes from the inside out. The life of the tree shows what it is. And the fruits it bears is what it's known by. And the church is known today. It's got an outside intellectual seminary experience. The best polished scholars we ever had. And the church has got the weakest pulpit it ever had in any age. Right. It's because we're trying to control it by intellectual. That's not God's program. God didn't intend it. Now look. You say, what can we do, Brother Lamb? What makes it? I said this afternoon I was going to speak on why some people can't keep the victory. Now, notice. Now the church doesn't need a polishing. It doesn't need a facelifting. It needs a birth. It needs a, a, a conversion. Something got to happen. Not just to strengthen our borders. Not to bring in new members. A revival is not to get new members. A revival is to revive what we got. That's what we so badly need. Not long ago in Chicago, I was standing out for the great famous Lake Michigan. And I noticed how those waves were leaping and jumping. And I thought, oh my, the lake's got a revival today. And I stood there, and there was someone standing with me. They said, pardon me, Brother Brandon? I said, the lake has a revival. They well, said, what do you mean by revival? I said, look how it's leaping and jumping, pounding its waves back and forth and dashing against each other, just frolicking. And he said, well, what do you mean a revival? I said, it's having a rejoicing time. And I said, but remember, there's not one more drop of water in it, and it's jumping as it is when it's quiet. Right. Now, our jumping and shouting and praising God is wonderful if we can still have the same amount of water when we come down to earth again. <laughs> That's right. The church is not built up on rejoicing and upon double dancing, but it's built upon the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the love of God. Well, you say, what good does a revival do then? If you notice, every time the sea has a revival or the lake, it just churns back and forth. It's to knock all the trash out of it. As you get the revival over, the trash is laying on the bank. It cleans itself in a revival. And God knows the church of the living. God needs a revival. For a lot of its nonsense is to be churned out of it. That's right. What makes the revival? What makes the lake churn is because there's a wind comes. That's right. The wind comes down from heaven and gives it a revival. That's what makes the church when a Russian mighty wind comes from heaven one day. A Pentecostal revival broke out. That's what we need today is another Russian mighty wind on the Pentecostal church to get the little isms and little differences out of it so the love of God can have a right away. Throw all the trash out on the back.
banks to clean her out. Let's get started again. In the Bible time, when the gold beater used to be, they used to take the gold before they had the smelter, and the beater would beat the gold, turn it over, beat it, and beat it, till it beat all the dross out of it. And how he knew that it got down to really good gold, all the pyrite and fool's gold and so forth was beat out of it, the beater could see the reflection of himself in it. Then he noted he had it clean. Listen, my dear friends, today, when the Holy Spirit, which is the beater, will beat the church with the gospel till the reflection of Jesus Christ shines into the church, then she's pure again. That's right. But we got too much pyrite and copper and other things in us yet. It must be brought out, and only the beater can do it. A revival is what we need. Now, you cannot bring a message of this brand new Holy Spirit baptism into a, a dry, formal, greedy church. You just can't do it. And I, I remember, I love you with all my heart, and I hope that God will let you know. But I've got a little boy at home, going on two years old. If I seen him doing wrong and I didn't correct him, I wouldn't love him. That's right. You, your children. Now, I want to say this. There are great move of the Church of the Living God in this nation has become in two fashions. One of them is going so stiff and starchy and intellectual, and the others went plumb off at the deep end on the other side. That's exactly the truth. That's right. Went plumb to the fanatic side. There's no middle of the road. I made that remark some time ago, and a good friend of mine, Roy Wheat, the, the state president of Indiana, of the Assemblies of God, he said, I heard someone say that you should drive in the middle of the road. He said, you know that's not good ethics. A man in the middle of the road would get run over. I bet him, I said, but look, my dear brother, you just think so much of the things of the world, that's the only way you can judge things. By the road, look, this is a one-way road. There's nobody coming back. You're going on or going on. That's right. Either one way or the other, you'll go in the starch farm of growth of deep in this world, go on with Christ. You don't turn and come back. There's no coming back. You just move on. We don't have any of them coming back. Now, notice, friends, we need a, a new bunch of real consecrated people. That's what we need. Now, the message today, perhaps, if we would, if the president would come to this city, he could say five words about something you ought to tear out this lake out here and something another like that, and they'd start draining that lake because the president said so. They ought to make a subway over here or something other. They would do it just because the president said so. But, brother, we are reading today from a book which is greater than any president's word. It is that a president takes care of... Oh, I love our president. He thinks he's a wonderful man. He does them kind of things. But as a national affair, well, what I'm speaking about, I'm talking not to the, the city officials in the way of taking care of their city. I'm talking to the church of God by the word of God. Here's where we need to change. Now, you can't hardly get the message to the old form of believing. Jesus spoke of that long time ago in the Bible. He said, you can't put new wine in old bottles. I often wondered what that meant. What did our Lord mean when he said, put new wine in old bottles? Well, I thought, what difference does it make? Because today, we only have glass bottles. And whether it is new or old, it doesn't make any difference. But when I visit the eastern countries, the Orient, I find out that the water bottles of that day was made out of animal skin. And then, when the animal skin was fresh and a new skin, or when it got old and dry and set to take new unfermented wine 
and put it in there, that new wine, unfermented, still has the germ of life in it. And when it begins to ferment, why the old bottles that were so set and stiff, why there was an explosion. It could not hold it. And it would just burst open. And you'd, the wine would perish and the bottle would perish. Now, that's the way it is today. You can't take this brand new heaven-born Pentecostal wine and mix it up with an old-time creed of some sort. Some old sentinel died died in the world. Why, if you do, you go to preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, divine healing and signs and wonders. That old skin will try to stretch and it'll go. The days of miracles just passed. I can't stand it no more. I can't even stand through this sermon. Bally, out the door it goes. Right. You can't do it. But to put new Pentecostal wine, you had to have new bottles. Right. And new bottles is new skin. It's still got animal oil in it. And that new skin will stretch. And when you begin to preach the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, divine healing, signs and wonders, a new skin, when the Bible said Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, the new skin will say, Amen. John, it'll stretch out. The old skin will say, Dr. Joel, don't you, don't teach it like that, see? There you are. That's the difference. What we need today is a brand new set of Pentecostal eyes. What? To preach a Pentecostal message. Now, Pentecost is not at your denomination now. Pentecost is an experience. It's not a denomination. Pentecost is what you receive. Now, try it. It's for the Methodists, the Baptists, the Lutheran, the Catholic, just as much Pentecost, and sometimes a whole lot more than those who call themselves Pentecost. Right. It's an experience when you can take it. Oh, and when that new life begins to work, and you read in the Bible, it says, I'm the Lord, heals all thy diseases. Then the new skin of that life begins to enter and stretch it out and says, Amen. I believe it, Lord. But now, what if you're all indoctrinated with a lot of this, your embalming fluid has been pumped into you, then the first thing you know, I, you know, I always felt sorry for a dead man. I go around to some of them morgues and look at that. I think the man's dead when you take him in there and then they shoot a lot of fluid into him to be sure he stays dead. And that's about the way it is with some of these churches today around the world America. They're dead to begin with and when you go in there they pop you full of some of their old intellectual embalming and fluid to be sure it just stay that way. What we need today is a resurrection of the old fashioned Pentecostal power. That's right. We need to get growing pains where we can stretch out in the Lord. Oh, I just hate to be all cramped up. Yes, sir, to a place where you can't say amen on your... Oh, that just gets on my nerves to do that. Here, not long ago, up in Kentucky, a little old Methodist church up there that really had the spirit. And the young couple got married out of that church and they took their letter down into Louisville. And they were having a, put in a great big city church where they were just as, oh, I don't know, so starchy and rich. And one day that little Kentucky mammy come down to, to visit her, her boy and, and her daughter-in-law. And, of course, they just went to church now and then. They stay home and look at television like the rest of them does. Stay away from prayer meeting. Just a normal, normal Christian like too much of our America is today. That's Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, and all, too. It's true. It's exactly right. We stay home to watch this or do that or take a little ride. It's too hot to go to church or something like that. I don't feel just good. You're going to feel worse than that some of these days when you're condemned at the judgment bar. Right? And there, this little old mammy, you know, she, she wanted to go to church. She said, well, honey, where do you go to church at? 
Well, they said, Mother, we go down to the great Trinity Methodist Church down here at the corner. Oh, she said, I just got to go to church in the morning. She said, it's the Sabbath and I must go. And then when Sunday morning came, they taken little mama down there in her little dress all up over her neck, this way in the long sleeves. And when she walked in, the ushers dropped back to get to say, well, what did where this fall out from? What antique shop did you bring this from? And she walked in, her hair combed on the back of her head, and her little face just as slick as a peeled onion. And she walks down through there and sits down. The minister got up with his frock tail coat on, you know, and his round around collar. And, and he got up there and he said, Now he said, My beloved congregation, we shall now enter into worship. And the little lady said, Well, glory! <laughs> Everybody looked around and stretched their neck like a bunch of Canadian ganders and looked around to see what had taken place. They wondered what happened. And the minister said, <coughs> He said, I shall try it again. And he said, uh, Well, now he says, now, Ladies and gentlemen, today we believe that Jesus Christ is the great one that's in our midst. She said, well, glory to God, amen. And the boy said, there with his head down, the girl with her head down, they didn't know what had happened. And he said, the usher come around, he said, madam, you're interrupting the minister. He just can't preach. It's quite a difference between him and I. If they're not holding amen, I can't preach. That's the only thing I do. I don't know where I'm standing. I think I like to hear amen means so be it. <laughs> the word's taking hope. It's going into the heart. And you know, I just wonder, she might not have been, her name might not have been so great in this earth that it was on who's who, but I would imagine it's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'd rather have my hand there than on all the who's who there is in the world. Right. Yes, I'd rather have it on the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes. That's the place to get it. Some time ago, I was up into northern British Columbia, and a scene came before me that just thrilled me. First, I'd been chasing an old grizzly bear on a horse, and the old fellow was determined I wasn't going to take his picture, but I thought I could. But I couldn't get close enough to him, and on a little old, about three-year-old horse and just been broken, he was trying his best to throw me. And over the as we went, me trying to head this old bear off. And I got turned around. I thought I couldn't, but I did. So I got turned around, and it got night on me, and I got up high on the hill, and I began to look around. I thought, which way did I come? Now, you know, you just don't want to get turned around up there, because you'll go 500 miles without a road or anything. So I said, well, in which way? And it was kind of cloudy, a little foggy, and that's the reason... I had to get close up to the old fellow to get a picture of him. And I looked around, I thought, oh, I'm sure this is the right direction. I rode a little while and the fog cleared away and the moon came out. And I thought, well, I can see my way to ride pretty good. If it's too bad, I'll just build up a fire and make the night of it. So then, after going a little while, my little horse was laddering pretty well. I tied him up, come to an old blowdown, a burnover rather. And it was a blow down too because the trees after it burned and the life went out of them. Many of them just laugh over each other when the winds blow. Then I stopped there and I let me rest. I got off and stood on there a little bit and kind of what I call buttermilk sky. It's kind of big white clouds and the moon shining through as it was going along. And I thought, well, this is some place to stop. And the winds were blowing as it had blown away the fog and and I began to hear the most mournful noise I ever heard. And I thought, what is that noise? And that's why I heard it again. Mm. And I thought, what a spooky place. And just then, the moon came out, those great big old dead pine trees standing there, and they were just bleached white, and that moon shining down on them looked like tombstones. And it was the most weary sound I ever heard. And I thought, what a place for me to stop. But I thought, Lord, do you want me to stay here? I had my little horse tied up, and I sat down and began to wonder. I thought, well, 
What makes them old trees moan like that? Makes it so weary for a person passing through here. Oh my, any traveler passing through this would be scared. Now I'd sit there a little while and watch this little old uh, scene take place. And I noticed after a while, down come the wind again. This is a great gush. And those old trees just moaned and groaned. I thought, well, what does this mean? And a little text over in Joel comes to my mind. What the palmer worm has left has the caterpillar eaten. What the caterpillar has left has the locust eaten. And all these little insects. I was thinking on that, that each of those insects are the same insect. It's just a different sphere. It goes away as one and comes back as another. The palmer worm, caterpillar, and locust is all the same insect. And then just a different stage of its life. And I thought, yes, that's right. Well, then I see why the Lord has stopped me here. These great big old trees once were real trees. And that reminds me of some of these great big starchy churches, you know. They stand way up high like that. Oh, my, they fill their still spire and fill it so high it looks all over the city. And my, just about as dead as the tree was. That, oh, they were once trees, sure. They were once filled with the Spirit way back in the Lutheran and Methodist age and so forth. But what the Lutheran left the Methodist eaten? What the Methodist left the Baptist gotten? What the Baptist left the Pentecostal gotten? <laughs> oh, the poor trees eat down. That's just about all the rest to it. Back in the beginning, that tree, God's heritage back there, which was his finest tree, it, in the new church they had fellowship, love, they had Bible doctrine, they had everything just right, and along come one insect to eat this out, and they would eat that out, so it's become nothing but a great, big, old, empty, spooky-looking place. That's about right. And then every time the wind would blow, they would just moan, and I said, that's right. Every time God repeats the Pentecostal experience, the only thing these big old boys can do is stand and go, mmm, days of miracles is past. Mmm, there's no such a thing as that. Just as spooky as it can be to try to drive the people away from it. I thought, well then, why do you send the men, Lord? Why do you send it anyhow? They're done, they're finished, they'll never receive it, just like them old cowhides were done dried and set. There's no way of trying to tell them anything because they'll never believe it. They done got set and callous and dried out and that's all of it. But I thought, why do you send the wind then? But then I remember Joe, Joe said, But I will restore, saith the Lord. I will give back to you all the years the caterpillar eaten and the locust eaten. I thought, where would it be, Lord? And I noticed down underneath these trees come up a bunch of undergrowth. A little bunch of trees. They were green, that's true. <laughs> the church might act a little green, but brother, it's flexible to the winds of God when it blows. Every time the wind would blow, those little trees would just laugh and jump and joy. Boy, I said, if that ain't an old fashioned Pentecostal meeting, I never seen one. That's right. Right. Certainly. Oh, that little trees when the wind blows, they're flexible. They'll say, I can't go to that meeting. I'm the Presbyterian. I belong to the assemblies. I oh, I wouldn't cooperate with that at all. You old stiff starch half dead. What's the matter? What we need today is a restoration of the cheery line busy postal breaking down experience in the churches of the living God. I thought, Lord, will you do it? And I seen that little bunch of backwash, they call us, you know, but splitters or offcasts or whatever it is. But they, you say, well, they were green. They might be green, but they're flexible to the wind. They can give, but then they got life in them anyhow. That's one good thing. I thought, what do you shake them so hard for? Every time you shake a tree, it loosens up the roots around so it can grow down and get a better hole. And every time we open up our hearts, and let the Holy Spirit come into us. It only shakes the roots loose so that we can go down and get a better hold on Christ Jesus. Anchor on the rock that cannot fail. Grounded in the Savior's love. 
what the church seems to do is to opening up and get green. Don't try to be, I'm Dr. Ph.D., my pastor is a... What does that mean anyhow? D.D. yourself. And the Bible, D.D. means done though. And I don't think it's changed very much since then. That's right. Well, what we don't need D.D. We need a Holy Ghost experience in the church of the living God. You know that it's true. We need to be greened up, lighted up. If God makes you act green, then go ahead and get light. <laughs> That's right. The lifeline hasn't been cut. The caterpillars hasn't been eaten. Oh, brother, one of these days, God's going to come down with his insect powder. He's going to sh- spray that over stuff, and she's going to grow just as short as the world. She's going to do it. Yes, sir. And God's going to restore all the years that the locusts and the caterpillars eat up. Now, on the day of Pentecost, they had 120 brand new sheepskin bottles. <laughs> Try it. Not goat skin, but sheep skin. It makes the best. <clears throat> yes, sir. And 120 green bottles are set in the upper room. Oh, plenty of stretching, growing pains. They have their hearts open to catch everything God the poor day. <laughs> yes, sir. Today we say, I'll go with it, but I'll tell you what, I don't believe. I don't care how much you bring it out of the Bible. I'll never believe it. You know, cowhide, goat skin. What's the matter anyhow? We need something to work on the Lord. The Holy Ghost can ever go to work. The doctor has something to work with. You know that's right. Oh, this Pharisaic age that we're living in. I tell you, I'll never let a seventh grade dummy tell me I come from so and so. I got a college education. But you haven't got gumption enough to know how to control it, maybe. That might mean a whole lot different, brother. I tell you, Paul had one too, but he said he forgot everything he ever knew in order to find Christ. The trouble of the church sees today, we need to dump out a whole lot of stuff so we can be filled up again. Here was that 120 green bottles sitting up there, and all of a sudden there came new wine from the heaven like a Russian mighty wind. It filled those little old green bottles and today got growing pains and they just bounced all over the country. Hey, if this is that. <laughs> Brother, if this ain't that, I'm going to keep this to that tune. That's one thing sure. <laughs> this marvelous, grand, Holy Ghost experience of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, His person and being working in us, through us all around. But what a thing it is. What a wonderful thing it is. It's got life in it. The church of the living God is full of life. It's the unfermented wine has still got the bacteria germ in it. That's killing it and growing it and pushing it and shoving it. That's what God's are doing. The experience of Christ. As a game warden, I used to walk by an old place where I, I thought the happiest spring I ever saw in my life. That little old spring was just a bubbling and a jumping all the time. So... One day when I was passing by, I sat down, I said, Little Spring, what makes you so happy? Why are you always a bubbling and going on? I said, Maybe it's because beers drink from you. And if he could speak back, he'd say, No, go with him. I said, Maybe because bears drink from you make you happy. He'd say, No, go with him. It isn't that. I said, Well, maybe it's because I drink from you. He'd say, No, that isn't that. But what makes you bubble? If he could speak back, he'd say, Brother Bram. It isn't me bubbling, it's something behind me pushing me and making me bubble. That's the way every born again son and daughter of God. It's not your emotions, it's something pushing in you, giving you the bubbling. Right? True. Yes, that's what we need today is experiences of the new birth. Now I want you to watch the order that Ezekiel brought it in. He said, I will give you a new heart and I'll give you a new spirit and I'll put my spirit in you. I want you to watch this. Three of it. A new heart. I'll take the old stony heart away. That's that old different heart you have. And I'll give you a new spirit. Now many times and it's been a terrible mistake but people have thought sometimes that that new spirit was the Holy Spirit. But it isn't. It's a new spirit. God gives you a new... Well, you couldn't even get along with yourself with your own spirit. 
How are you going to get along with the Holy Ghost? God had to give you a new spirit so you could get along with His spirit. And sometimes people are doing what? Right. A new heart, a heart of flesh, so you will receive it. Then a new spirit in that heart, and then I'll put my spirit in that. You see, new heart, new spirit, and my spirit. Three things he spoke of. Now, many times we try to make that thing just say, well, as soon as you get the new spirit, you put your stealing, you put your lying, things like that. You say, oh, hallelujah, I got it. And you find out the first time anyone crosses your path a little bit, oh, mercy. <laughs> what a difference. Sure, you blow up like a frog eating buckshot. But let me tell you, brother, that's the reason you ever got God's spirit. That's true. Oh, you say, he stepped on my toe. I'll just not put up with that. All right. That shows what you got in you. That's true. I'll put a new spirit in you. And I'll put my spirit in you. Now, the heart is in the center of the emotions of the human being. Your heart is the middle of you. That's exactly right. So God puts a new heart in the middle of the old man, then he puts a new spirit in the middle of the new ha- spirit, a heart, and puts his spirit in the middle of the new spirit. Now, it's all just exactly like the mainspring in a, in a, a famous watch. You see, they got a little click over here working, a little click over here working, it's little wheels are turning. But it's all controlled by the mainspring. Now, you could have the trouble of today, we've left off the mainspring, brother. We try to make ourselves Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, build great churches, say, look at all the fine watch you got. Look at all the fine steam it's got on it. Look at the faith out of it. It's got rubies in it. It's got jewels in it. It isn't worth a dime if it don't keep time. Right. That's what's the matter today. We try to get Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterian and Pentecostals, and we try to get the prettiest church, the best pastor, the smartest man, and everything, and our church just don't keep time with God's Bible. That's what's the matter. See? You left out His Spirit. Having Jesus said, Have you heard that this stone that the uh, builders rejected has become the chief of the corner? Certainly, the mainspring. Now, when the mainspring is in the watch, and this watch is a, not a self-winding, it's a God-winding watch. And the only thing you do to, to a self-winding watch, the only way you do is your emotions with the watch is what winds it. And your emotions towards the Word of God is what winds you up with the Holy Ghost as you're taking God's Word. There it is, the new watch. Now, you know, Ezekiel saw it again. And he, the same prophet, he saw it as a wheel in the middle of a wheel, turning up in the air. Now, the wheel first is a, ri- is a rim, the tire, then the rim, then the spokes, and then the hub. Now, when Luther started the just shall live by faith, justification, he put the tire around it. Yes. All right, there's much of a wheel yet. All right, then, here on come Methodists with sanctification, put the tongue with the rim around it. And then along come Pentecost, and they taught sanctification to Luther, uh, the Methodists. The Luther called justification, which was a tile on the outside, and the rim then was the Methodists with, with sanctification. And the Pentecostals come along, and they put a spoke in it, speaking in tongues. But let me tell you, brother, it don't consist just of that. That's the reason we're lumping, bumping down the road the way we are. There's not one spoken there, but there's nine spiritual gifts in that church, not just one. That's all right. The tar's all right. The rim's all right. The spoke's all right. But like the colored man eat the watermelon, there's more of it. And that's what I mean today. There's more of it. There's nine spiritual spokes in this wheel, and it's turned by the wheel in the middle of the wheel, all connected with the hub. Oh, I feel religious. <laughs> I sure do. Yes, brother. The good thing, no matter what we're doing, how you're doing it, you're fighting the air because God's done said, I will restore, saith the Lord. It's got to go. Now, the hub is where it all turns from. 
and the mainspring is where all the watch works from. That mainspring, it picks it right out. Keep that up, flush and just and perfect. Now these gifts, your gift of tongues, wonderful. Justification by faith, wonderful. Sanctification, fine. Speaking of tongues, wonderful. Interpretation, fine. Messages from God, wonderful. Prophecy, fine. Brother, if it hasn't got no hub in it, what's he going to do to you? Your spokes will get across one another, they'll cross up, fuss, fight, isolate, and join. Carrying up each other, that's what's the matter. We need the mainspring. What good does it do to have the little bitty springs and the little bitty gadgets in here and the winding springs and the lines and the faces and the big hands and all oh, this thing if there isn't something in there to make it operate? I believe the Pentecostal church has got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I believe the rest of you do too, they claim it. I believe your speaking in tongues is right. I believe that your progress is right. I go with you on other being a Baptist. I believe it. Sure I do. But here's one thing, brother. It's not keeping the right kind of time. That's what I'm trying to say. So it takes the baptism of the Holy Ghost to come into that human heart there to make the thing run right. The love of God. God is love. And if each one of these gifts is put out in the center of love, it'll become selfish and indifferent and put itself off and isolate itself and cross over and fuss and stew. But when it's anchored right into the middle of love, it'll fellowship everywhere. And that's right. That's exactly what we need. The church is dying for love, brother. Our gifts are all right. Our denominations is all right. Nothing against them. But we're centering our whole hopes on our denomination. You're centering your whole hopes on gifts. As Jesus said, many will come to me that day and say, Lord, have I prophesied your name, cast out devils your name, done great works? He said, I'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never even knew that. Paul said, though I speak with tongues like men and angels, and have not love, I'm nothing. So I understand the Bible. I got a PhD, double LD. I understand all the mysteries of God. And it is the stuff in the hub down of love. The thing won't keep dying in the Bible. See? It just won't do it. So, doctor, I have nothing. I wish I had a doctor's degree. Somebody wanted to give me one little bit. I said, I'm too smart for that. <laughs> yes, sir. I said, I'm, just, I'm glad I'm too smart to be a doctor. I said, my old Kentucky... That's last southern talking and his ain't don't touch Terry like that people's too intelligent. I wouldn't be a hypocrite. If I had one, I'd be glad to not take one on them terms. I'd rather be what I am and serve the Lord. Sure. Be honest with people and with God. If you won't be honest with the people, you won't be honest with God. We need the love of God. That controls the whole thing. Now your watch is all right. Your means and your, all of your springs is all right. Your little second hands is all right. All of your little gifts and everything is all right. But brother, let's get the main spring back in it. Oh my. That's what makes every little thing. I watch the main spring work. When the when love goes to work, you know what happens? The method is said, come on, Baptist. Let's rock together. All right. Come on, Presbyterian. You Pentecostals. Let's all join together and have a real city-wide revival. There you are. Then the springs begin to control. The Holy Spirit's begin moving. Then the Baptist won't put that you for speaking in tongues, and neither will you get out of order with it. And the Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, all together will all operate in one great big unit of the Church of the Living God, and she'll keep exactly time with the Bible. And absolutely, are the signs of the time. We're living in the last days. She's got to keep time with this Bible. This is, and you know, every once in a while, if that talk happens to be getting just a little bit dry, God will give you a drop of oil from heaven. And he'll just oil it all up, and she'll just run fine after that. Yes, sir, if you'll do it. Now, notice, a new heart, a new spirit, and then I'll put my spirit within you. Now, and you'll keep all my statutes and all my judgments when that mainspring begins to tick, when the stone that's rejected, when the love of God is brought back amongst the people of God, then you're going to see the church of God all fellowshipping with one another without any friction at all. 
I remember when those servants in the Bible, they said, Our Lord, the race is coming, they begin to die whenever and bite and fuss and stew. And the Lord come and caught them that way. They had lamps, but no oil in them. See? And when they did, they were cast out of the outer darkness. Brother, why take a substitute when the genuine is your hand? Why would you take something different when the real thing is your hand? Then, when you get that mainspring working within you, Christ, the love of God in your heart, working within you, then it will begin to express these kind of particular love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, patience, faith, mercy, all of mine. They just pick right with those. Then, you know what? The yoke that you're yoked with with Christ doesn't chaff your neck anymore. It is a burden to bear. Then we just go on. It's all got feathers on it, then. It's right. The burdens are few. And you know what you do with it when somebody comes over and say, Hey, wasn't you down to that Holy Roman meeting? I thought I'd seen you go up the world. <clears throat> I tell you, see, it, it kind of chaps you a little bit. But because the mainspring's not working. That's right. But when the mainspring goes to working, when that person says, I hear it, lady, you become the Holy Roman. So you're not going to join our little cigarette party anymore. Now, if you haven't got the means for you, say, John, I tell you, I've thrown away no more cigarettes. I know it. I heard on the radio that I heard the other day that there'll be more people die in America this year from smoking cigarettes with throat cancer, causing throat cancer, and was killed in four years of the last world war. No one died in the United States was killed on both sides. You heard that radio cast yesterday? That said about the cancer, it's absolutely proven that smoking cigarettes cause cancer. And no, why don't they stop it? What's the matter? The television and everything else is full of that gum and all kinds of stuff like that. Still, it's because the buzzards want it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You can't talk to a buzzard about anything dead because that's all he eats on. That's right. Change his nature one time. He'll certainly keep off of it. He says, Doctor, oh, you think I'm hard. I don't mean to be hard. I love you. But, brother, you got to get broke up before you can be molded again. It's exactly right. We've got to know that's the truth. I'm quoting to you the scripture. Certainly, God, that man, that old yoke that you yoked up with with Christ, if that means springs are working, the love of God's are flowing from your heart. And somebody says, hey, I heard you was a holy river. You don't drink anymore. You don't smoke anymore. That's right, sister. Oh, I have found the treasure. It's so sweet in my heart. I wish I could tell you about it. Oh, yes, it just puts feathers all over the cross. It just makes it, you know what you do? Those burdens that stone up on you, you carry them off. It seems like Samson with the brazen gates of, of, of Gaza. Why, he just packed it up to a certain hill. And laid them down. And when you really got the main spring working in your heart, the love of God flowing out, and they call you any kind of name they want to, that will do a very good for them to say that. You'll pack it to a certain hill called Calvary, and there you will lay down and pray for that person. Right? You won't fuss and stew with the people about this side or the other. Uh, well, if you become a real child of God, well, all those things just passed away. You yoked up, and oh, it's such a pleasure to pack the yoke of Christ with him. Know that you're yoked together as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and you're joint heirs with him in heaven. It's easy. Now, what do we do when this comes into us, when this love comes in? I believe I was preaching to you the other night how that, that love is projected. How that the burdens seem like. How that love casts out fear. You won't be scared if you got that love in you. And the Bible says you can be healed. You'll take God at his word. You won't care about nothing as long as love's there. Making all of these things move around. If things don't go right, that doesn't matter. you still got love. See, it holds you. The apostle wanted to show us the power that comes for this love. This mainspring. Look at Jesus. He took us over to the tomb. Look at Jesus laying there. His face is scarred. It's deathly pale. All of the blood has run out of his body. His hands are all drove through with spikes and torn. His feet tore. 
They will be your cold dead three days. Then watch. All of a sudden I see a bunch of soldiers running like training over each other. Watch that. Then I notice the color begins to come back into his lips. What's God doing is showing the power of that love. He raised him up, he stands to the tomb, singing, All hail, royal power. Watch him as he goes about. A few days later, when he gathered his disciples on the bank, he's preaching to them, and the last beautiful lips of his working there bringing forth words and falling, going into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. These signs shall follow them that believe. And as he begins to speak, I begin to see daylight coming under his feet. What's the matter? God showing his power. He's raising up. What is he? He's, he's just defying every law of gravitation. He's being lifted up. Why? He is the creator of gravitation. Here he is. He ascends on up to him, gets up on high, and he sits down quietly at the seat of the majesty on high. Glory to God. There he is with all power. His hands and earth is in his hands. Not even one little rain can move on the ocean without he permits it. There is his power. Hallelujah. That power, that same thing, working in us to make us new creatures in Christ Jesus. Oh, brother, there's no power comes as our faith brings down our faith, which is love that casts us away. All fear that we believe that God wouldn't keep his word. When I thought of it, love and grace is Christ, and it brings him right down to us. That mighty power of God begins to work into the church. Love that conquers, I tell you, love is the most powerful thing there is in the world. There's nothing will take its place. Love. Some time ago, a little girl went off to college and she come back bringing a little girl with a little feist. And when she got back, she was getting off the train and her old mother was standing out there. And the little girl that she had with her said, Who is that old miserable looking wretch? And the girl was ashamed. Oh, she said, I don't know. And when she got off the train, the little old mother, I'm so darling, I'm so glad to see her, turned her back. And the conductor was standing there. He said, Mary, I'm going to ask you a question. So how can you get so indifferent that you've been away to the college? Is that what you learn in your intellectuals? And I'm afraid that's what we've learned all about, substituting intellectuals in the state of love. Right? said, Mary, it is true, but I'm an old man too. I know how your mother's ugly today. The reason your mother is ugly, one day you were up in her upper room and she was hanging clothes in the backyard. And so while she was hanging clothes back there, fire caught the house and somebody went and told her. And you were in a little room pinned off in the blazes. Everyone her, stay out, stay out. But she wouldn't do it. She jerked her apron from her and through the flames she went and she grabbed you and wrapped you up in her clothing. And she come through, and she was burned and scarred, and that's what makes her ugly today. And the reason you're pretty is because that she's ugly. She become ugly so you could become pretty. And you mean to tell me that you'd be ashamed of your own mother? I think this day, brother, when it's taken one thing, not an intellectual being, but it's taken the love of God to send Christ to the cross and to die there in disgrace and shame. And you need to tell me that the Pentecostal church or any other church will turn down the real love of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God to salvation. If you want to say, holy, oh, holy, let it like that as long as the love of God put down in my heart. Certainly, doesn't matter. Oh, brother, God gave the Holy Spirit God's love to control the church. Not smart, educated, but love. Gifts go in the church, but it don't control the church. Love controls the church. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. His love constrained to do it. 
And when the love is constrained, then sorry grace projects its object. May I say that again? When divine love is projected, grace produces its object. And God loved the world so much till a sovereign grace projected a Savior to the world. Yes, indeed. And when you love God so much, sovereign grace will project to you a baptism of the Holy Ghost to make you live in love and to be a real Christian. And there was just a thought here many thousands of years ago when this old earth here was nothing but a big volcanic eruption. There wasn't a speck of life on it. Never had been. Nothing but just volcanic eruption. God, the great Holy Spirit, the Logos went out of God. We call it the Holy Spirit. And when it went out from God, it came to the earth. Listen and step quiet just a minute, will you now? I close just a minute, and I want you to think sincerely with intellectuals that to do it. Think, is your denomination going to do it? Is your personality going to do it? Or is the Holy Spirit going to do it? Let me ask you something. When this great chaos was here, there was nothing here. Just nothing but bare rocks. It was volcanic, had cooled off. And there she lay. And the Holy Ghost came forth like a hymn to her death, and she began to brood over the earth. And she began to brood, or the word brood is or coo, or make lyre, pluck like the hymn to her, ch- her chicks or brood, as it began to speak, let there be, let there be. And I can notice all over the earth there was nothing but our bodies laying there. We are taught that our bodies come from the earth. We are made of 16 different elements. That's petroleum, cosmic light, and all polish and calcium and so forth. 16 different elements. That's the body. How do we get it built up like this? We eat food. Every day when we put in food, something dies. If you eat today, something has to die so you can live. Every time, uh, because you're living, something dies because you live. If you eat beef, the cow dies. If you eat mutton, the sheep died. If you eat fish, the fish died. If you eat bread, the wheat died. If you eat potatoes, the potato died. If you eat beans, the beans died. Whatever it is, it's a lie. And we can only live by dead substance. And now listen, my brother, I'm going to ask you something. If it takes, if it takes death to make life here, how much more than something has to die so we can live in more how much more did it do? Not the little small preacher, not a Catholic priest, not a rabbi, but it's taken the life of the Lord Jesus Christ to get his eyes on the sin. That's the Holy Spirit so we can live again. Christ said we go to hell. We have to be a man, so don't you think of it. Notice something has to die for you to live daily. Something has to die for you to live eternally. Not your intellectual, nothing that you can do about it, but it's accepting the eternal life that God gave. Watch the Holy Spirit now, as it was brooding, oh, cooing like a dove. Here it is cooing over the earth now. First thing you know, I begin to notice a little petroleum coming together out yonder. What is it? Let us look. Petroleum. A few cows, a little calcium comes together. Some iron. What happens? A beautiful little Easter lily raises itself up out of the earth. What was it? The Holy Spirit brooding. Come on, me. All oh, the way the labor. And the lily raised. The father looks over and says, That's beautiful. Just keep brooding. And that's where our grass come up. That's where our trees come up. That's where our birds flee out of the dust. That's where our animals come out of the dust. Then what happens? Up come a man. What was it? Brooding the Holy Spirit. Not a church, the Holy Spirit. And here comes the man up. God said he don't look right. So the woman is not in the original creation. She's a byproduct of man. So God lays him down on the table of operation and takes a rib from his side and makes a little sweetheart. 
and Eve and Adam with their arms locked through it, around each other, walking down through, and the first thing you know, a great wind blows. And Eve said, Oh, darling, that wind. He said, Peace. She said, Oh, baby, he was a son of God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I may act crazy. I don't think I am. But look, brother, something within me when I think of these things. Oh, my. When I think of it, what difference does old age mean now? What difference does anything mean now? Notice, in a few minutes, up come a great roar she couldn't be scared. Who was it? Leo the lion. He said, come here, Leo, and pat him like he would a kitten. She'd have come up. The tiger, they moved down through the old and looked at the great paradise. After all, little Adam said, it's not time to turn the television on. But darling, the sun is going down. It's time for us to go worship. Oh, God. It's time for us to go worship. Not we're going down to hear Dr. Jones and we're going down to hear Bill Branham or anybody else. But we're going up to worship. And up, not in a great big fiery place, but they went under the trees and there come a real soft light down the middle of the Holy Spirit, the Christ the anointed, came down and he said, Children, have you enjoyed your stay on the earth that the Lord thy God has put me on? Yes, Father, we're giving all praise to thee. And he comes down and he kisses them on the cheek and he lays them down to sleep. And you know, pray, you know how beautiful it is to go in to your bedroom at night. I do to my little boy and stand there with little Joseph and with my wife and we'll kiss him from one side of the cheek to the other and we're laying him to bed. And I say, Mama, you know, he's got eyes something like yours. You see that bed? And he, he, he kind of touches it in mind of you when his mouth shape and so forth. It's the resemblance of this holy red light. And when God looked upon Adam and Eve and she had felt the resemblance him, for they were made in his image. How he kissed them and how his great heart must have felt. There was no harm to come. The tiger laid down. The other little hand laid down. Nothing would harm. Then along comes sin, brother. It spoils that beautiful picture. He would have never needed Max Baxter's to picture a cosmetic place. No, sir. It was God, the very blush of eternal life that her made her beautiful. She would never have to have manicures and everything like they do today. Seems what brought you to that place. But I'm telling you, every man will know that when we eat, we renew our lives. And then when we get to be, I ask the doctor, I said, doctor, every time I eat, I renew my life. So that's correct, Reverend Branham. I said, why is I eat the same thing now I eat when I was 16 years old? When I was 16, I'd eat, I get big and stronger all the time. I eat the same food then and get older and weaker all the time. Tell me why I do. I said, if I'm pouring water out of the jug into a glass and filling up my other ones, they're all pouring the water away again. Explain it to me scientifically. He said, well, then that cannot be done. I said, yes, it can, doctor. I beg your pardon, but the Bible says so. It's a pardon of the man. can man go to meet that appointment. The brother in the blessed resurrection, every wrinkle and all of all age mark will be done away. That's the mark of sin. All his men can see it will be done away. Hallelujah. The old will be young there forever. My wife said to the lady, I told him what you had left. She said to me, Billy, you're getting bothered. I said, my nah, sweetheart, I haven't lost a word of them. She said, what's that, dear? I said, I haven't lost a one of them. She said, where are they at? I said, sweetheart, let me ask you one thing. You answer me now, will you? She said, all right, dear. I said, where were they before I got them? They were somewhere. Everyone that was before I got them, they ain't there waiting for me in the resurrection. Hallelujah! Only oh, yes, brother. Yes, brother. Now look, I'm going to ask you something. If the tough the Holy Ghost subdued you out of the earth and out of the earth you have come, and there you are now, Joe, up to an intelligent person. And 
now, if you without any choice, the Holy Spirit made you what you are today, then how much more can He who brought you from the earth in the first place raise you up in the last days, though your body be scattered from the east to the west? Remember your bodies were laying here when the Holy Ghost began to bleed in the first place. If it didn't worry where it come from. Your talents and polish and cosmic light and control the light more on the earth. God has put you together. And no one else can do it. You can't get polish and calcium and pull together and make a man. It takes the spirit and the life of God to come into the land to make him what he is. My friend, don't you be deceived. God doesn't run his church upon intellectuals. It's the brooding of the Holy Ghost trying to say, Do you love me? Do you believe me? And if he brought me what I am without me having any more, any choice, how much more will he give me back my life with eternal life with it if I bring back to him the yes, Holy Spirit? I don't care what the world says. I love you. I love you. I love you. How much more when he wants the counsel and punish in that great day he is speaking that body of flesh back again. Every hair on the head, every bit of the strength that was in my body will make immortal life will come forth again. Yes, brother, God gave the Holy Ghost the job of taking care of the church. Look, the Bible said when the unclean spirits going out of many walks in dry places, when he comes back he finds it different. Here's what's the matter. When that unclean spirit comes back to your place, listen now. I may be just a little lengthy, but you've got plenty of time yet. Listen, I'll ask you something. You used to go to dances and shows and sit all night. Listen, this is eternal life. The reason that you have your ups and downs is when the unclean spirit goes out, that's just as far as you go, you get a new heart or something. You gotta face the show. You got something you've got on a little something outside. And when he comes back, he finds you still living in old Tim Pan Alley with all your temper and all your indifference and everything. But when the Holy Ghost moves in there, God sends his big bulldozer down from heaven and he turns that thing upside down, strips it all off, and tears us it out. And you know, because he's there, the eat no more tin cans there, the eat no more hateful there, the eat no more malice there, and he finds a great big mansion that the Holy Ghost is living in, and because he's there, his presence there brings up beautiful flowers all around on the terrace, flowers of love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, meekness, generous. That's not a pink pit any longer. It's a place where the Holy Ghost dwells. Hallelujah. Oh, I've got to stop, go out, feel like I, I'm just about getting right to preach now. I just feel good. Right. Brother, let me tell you something. What this church needs today is to get back in that real place of God again where the Holy Ghost can have control and bring you forth love and fellowship. Listen, the world needs love. I'm going to tell you just a second, man. We'll close. The Lord willing. I'm a hunter. You know I love the nature. And I used to go up into the north woods to hunt years ago. I still go once in a while. I met a farm friend up there, a man may be sitting in this building today, Bert Carl. Oh, wonderful man. He was a good hunter. I like to hunt with him because he was strong, sturdy. We could climb their mountains and run other places. He had a good keen eye. I could watch game. And I enjoyed hunting with him. Not easy to get him lost. You couldn't turn him around. You know they were training the marks and things and where to go. And one time while we were up there, I went up, he was a good man, a good hunter, but a brutal hearted person. Oh, he was so wicked in his heart. And he would just kill little thorns just to be, just for the fun because he went out the preacher. I said, Bert, aren't you ashamed of yourself to do that? Oh, he said, get next to yourself, preacher. You're just chicken hearted. I said, Bert, don't do that. Now the Lord forbid admit you to have a, a thorn. That's all right. That's your business. Abraham went and he had a calf and said it to God. That's right. And it's all right. But not just to kill a whole bunch of them. And he just beamed. So one year when I was out there, he had him a little whistle. And he could take that little whistle and cry just like a baby farm. I never heard anything so to impersonate or to mimic in my life. And I said, Bert, you're not going to use that all. He said, oh, go on, preacher. That's what's the matter with you guys. You're too chicken-hearted. I said, Bert, shame on you. You wouldn't do that. We went on into the woods and we hunted, practically, 
half a day or more, hadn't seen tracks or nothing. And we stooped down, there's a little opening, and I noticed him reach in his pocket and get this little whistle. Oh, oh no, you won't do that. And the way all little scream sounded like a little baby thorn crying. And all of a sudden, right across the plate, a great big beautiful doe raised up, that's the mother deer. She raised up, I seen those great big graceful ears, big brown eyes, she wasn't 30 yards from me. Bert looked up to me and smiled, and I thought, oh, Bert, don't do that. You're not going to do that. And I could see her walking out there, her head up, pretty animal. That was, what was making her walk out there? Something in her, a mother's love, a baby a cry. She walked out of the open. She would have done it for nothing otherwise. But what was it? The strain was on. She was a mother. She couldn't help it. A baby was crying, and a mother instinct in her let her out. She's trying to find that baby. I've seen Bert take and shove his lever back, throw the shell to the barrel, level up with his rifle. Oh, he was a dead shot. I thought, oh, God, don't let him do that. Now that mother out there displaying that love like that, how can he do it? And when the, the lever clicked down on where the bolt action on the rifle went in, I seen level up down the crosshair that spoke right across the heart of that mother. I know within seconds he'd blow her heart plumb out of her. I thought, oh, how can he do it? How can he do that? And I thought, oh, I, I don't see it. And I looked around just in a second. The mother doe saw the hunter. She startled. She threw her big head up. Did she run? No. Why? There was a baby in trouble. She must find that baby. Though her heart would be glued out, she must find that baby. It was in trouble. Why? It wasn't something she was putting on like the church is trying to do. It was something in her. She was a mother. She had to find that baby. She started walking up, her eyes on that hooter, asking that girl come down, and I thought, oh, God. I just turned my head up to him. I didn't hear the rifle fire. I thought, what's the matter? Wonder what happened. I turned to look, and when I did, I'd seen the rifle girl go like right this. He turned around and looked at me. He threw the rifle on the ground and grabbed it in my hand. And that's really I had enough of it. I can't stand it no more. Is that silly pray that God would give me a Christian heart like you, God? I don't want to be like this. Right there on that ground, I led that cold-hearted man to the loving spirit of Jesus Christ. Why? What happened? What happened? Because the sermon he looked over it. What happened? Because he seemed to display the real, genuine, holy love. Brother, sister, what the church needs today is the display. Not put on, not an intellectual education, but a display. A display of the real love of God in our heart. Let us bow our heads while we think of the other people. What is it? Maybe you've been a church member for a long time. What do you really have when you say, I've got to quit this, I've got to do this? Is that the way you operate as intellectual? But is there something in you? Is there something in you? The real love of God in your heart. If it isn't, why don't you accept it today? Why would you accept the substitute? Have all of you got to know that you're a Christian because you belong to a church? If all of you got to know you're a Christian is because you shouted? All of you got to know that you're a Christian because you spoke with tongues? I believe in all these things, but I've seen witches and witnesses speak with tongues. All that you've got to be, maybe you've got all in your hands or a bloody face or something like that to recognize you're a Christian? Is that all you got? Brother, you're miserable. Yes. Why not you take the risk? Why not take a substitute when the Pentecostal skies are full of the rainbow? Where those tombs they shall cease, 
Whether it's miracles, whether it's even more, whether it's knowledge, it'll fail, whether it's prophecy, it'll fail. But when that which is perfect, which is love, comes, it shall endure. It shall forever more endure saints and angels' songs. Pills can't write about it. There's no way to explain it. Now, while you're thinking over it, do you really want the real love of God in your heart? And you haven't got it. Now, be honest with God. And as God's servant, I bring you in Jesus Christ's name in the presence of Almighty God. And if there's one speck in you that's really sincere, I pray God will bring you out this afternoon. Do you really know that you're sure of that experience? Would you raise your hand to God and say, God in Christ's name, give me that in my heart. God bless you. That's wonderful. It is just all over everywhere. I want the Christian love to display like that dear heaven butter's love to display. I want my Christian love to be displayed in such a way that it will others. Not my emotions, but my Christian love. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how fabulous and strong. It shall forever more endure saints and angels' songs. Do you really want it? Have you believed me to be God's servant? If you have, I don't care if you're in the balcony where you are. Don't look at kind brother. Don't think because it's four o'clock or the lacquer. Don't think of that. Think of what eternity is. If you haven't got that, and you believe that God hears my prayer to make the people walk and the blind to see, that's just a prayer, that's all. But if you believe it would help you, you believe that I am God's servant, and you want that kind of experience, I just knew 200 years ago went up. I want you to come right down here, stand with me. I want to shake your hands and pray with you. Come down now while we sing. Just as I am with you, Lord. All right. Just.